Finding success as a head coach in the NFL is usually a long and difficult process. It's extremely rare for a rookie head coach to win games right out of the gate, especially with a team that still needs a lot of work. Kevin Stefanski established himself as one of the few exceptions to that rule by turning the Cleveland Browns into a contender in just his first season as the head coach, a task that 11 coaches before him attempted and ultimately failed. Stefanski took a talented but dysfunctional offense that lacked an identity and turned it into an efficient, explosive, and at times downright devastating unit. That kind of transformation doesn't happen overnight. So today, I'll talk about the adjustments that Stefanski made in order to put Cleveland on a trajectory towards Super Bowl contention. One of the many issues with the 2019 Browns offense under Freddie Kitchens was Baker Mayfield's unorthodox dropback style. He used to set up in the shotgun with his right foot in front of his left, then when he took the snap, he would take his first drop step with his left foot, adding an extra step to every drop back. This would extend Mayfield's drop depth and the time it took to reach that depth, ultimately making it more difficult for the offensive line to keep pass rushers from winning to the outside. This dropback style played a significant role in Mayfield's high sack total in 2019, but Freddie Kitchen's play calling just made matters worse. Kitchens would call far too many long developing route concepts that forced Mayfield to take a deep drop and made an already subpar offensive line look terrible. In 2020 though, Baker began setting up the opposite way, with his right foot in the back, which helped his offensive tackles seal up the edges and marginally improved his performance on those deep dropbacks that he struggled with in 2019. On 5 and 7 step dropbacks in 2019, Mayfield completed less than half of his passes, posted a touchdown percentage of 6%, an interception percentage of 5%, a passer rating of 75.2, and was pressured over 45% of the time. Last season, though, Mayfield recorded improvement in just about every meaningful stat category you could come up with, including extreme improvements in completion percentage, interception percentage, and passer rating. The changes made to his dropback style, combined with Stefanski's schematic adjustments, all but eradicated Mayfield's previous struggles with deep dropbacks. With a newfound trust in his offensive line and a transformation in dropback footwork, Mayfield went from one of the worst quarterbacks in the league on deep dropbacks to one of the best in only one season, and you'll see that this is just the beginning. Stefanski made many more pass game adjustments, including a decrease in the team's use of the shotgun, a decrease in the percentage of throws that Baker made from within the pocket, and an increase in the rate at which the offense used designed rollouts. These seemingly small offensive modifications were made to mold the offensive structure around Baker Mayfield's skill set, and they had a significant impact on his performance. At around 6'1", Mayfield is undersized for his position, so by getting him out of the pocket more often, Stefanski ensured more clear throwing lanes, a luxury that Mayfield had far less often under Kitchens. Now, Mayfield's 2019 numbers will tell you that he's not a good deep passer. When throwing over 20 yards downfield, his completion percentage was under 40%, he threw more interceptions than touchdowns, and posted a passer rating of 77.7. .7. But these numbers are not indicative of Mayfield's actual deep passing ability. His difficulty when throwing the ball downfield in 2019 had much more to do with offensive structure and poor pass protection than Mayfield himself. Take a look at this play from Week 5 against San Francisco. The post-snap play action fake will draw the linebackers up close to the line of scrimmage, and Jarvis Landry's over route from the slot is designed to get into the space vacated by those linebackers. But like the play action fake, Landry's route is a decoy. When safety Jimmy Ward sees Landry cut over the middle after the play action fake, he'll assume responsibility for the route, thus creating a one-on-one -on -one matchup all the way to the outside at the top of your screen. The problem with this play wasn't the route design though, it was the pass protection call. As you can probably tell by now, there's a lot going on here, and for everything to go as planned, Mayfield will need some time in the pocket. But for a reason I still have yet to understand, despite watching this play over and over again, Cleveland called a full protection slide to Baker's right, ultimately isolating one of the league's best pass rushers, Nick Bosa, against a tight end on the edge. Full slides are typically used in the quick game, because a tight end can't be expected to hold up in protection against any NFL edge rusher, let alone Nick Bosa. But the play action concept that Cleveland called required Mayfield to hold onto the ball for a relatively long time. Bosa predictably won his matchup immediately 
forcing Mayfield into a bad read. But if normal half-slide protection was called, Mayfield would have had the time to see Richard Sherman's jump on the deep post route and check down to Nick Chubb in the flat. So yes, it was a bad read on a deep pass, but reads like these don't make a quarterback a bad deep passer. Going into the 2020 season, Stefanski knew that despite Mayfield's abysmal 2019 deep passing stats, eliminating or even minimizing the deep passing game in Cleveland's offense would be extremely counterproductive, because Mayfield is and always has been a solid deep passer under the right circumstances. After Stefanski's adjustments to Cleveland's deep passing attack, Mayfield posted improvement in completion percentage, average yards per attempt, interception percentage, and passer rating. He took slightly fewer shots downfield in 2020 than he did in 2019, but when he did throw deep last season, his risks were far more calculated. Here, Mayfield motions his running back outside, and the safety following him indicates man coverage. The man coverage indicator and the single high safety shell tell Mayfield that his tight end, David Njoku, is isolated against single coverage in the slot against a much smaller defensive back. This was a low-risk throw, and the key to making this a low-risk throw was pre-snap information. And that brings me to my next point, which is the help that the new coaching staff gave Baker Mayfield at the line of scrimmage. Pre-snap to post-snap coverage identification was one of the biggest issues with the 2019 Browns offense, but the new offense under the new coaching staff used far more pre-snap motion. The rate at which the offense used pre-snap motion doubled from 2019 to 2020, and the impact of that adjustment on Baker Mayfield and the Browns passing game can't be overstated. Take this play from wildcard week against Pittsburgh as an example. Pre-snap, Jarvis Landry goes in motion across the formation, and the fact that he's followed indicates man coverage. It's third down and four, and Landry's running an angle route, which is one of the most difficult routes to defend in man coverage. So as soon as Mayfield saw Mike Hilton follow Landry, he knew exactly where he was going with the ball. The information provided by the pre-snap motion simplified Mayfield's post-snap process, and in plays like the one you just saw, simplifying the quarterback's process can be the difference between a punt and a huge gain. Pre-snap coverage identifiers are a quarterback's best friend, but a proper pass protection call is equally as important, especially when the defense sends extra pass rushers. Mayfield struggled against the Blitz in 2019, but his understanding of pass protection calls and comfort in making those calls marginally improved in 2020, as did his production against the Blitz. Here's an example from back in Week 2 against Cincinnati. Pre-snap, the defense presents a 5-man bear front, which prompts a 5-0 protection call from Mayfield. This is a pretty standard protection call against a bear front because it prevents confusion up front and guarantees that all down linemen will be blocked post-snap. Just before the snap, though, Baker took a hard count, which caused the Sam linebacker to creep up toward the line of scrimmage, while the Will linebacker backed off. This told Mayfield that the blitz was actually coming from his right side, and allowed him to adjust the protection call accordingly. So, Mayfield switched the protection call from 5-0 to a full slide to his right, and because Mayfield knew that the Sam linebacker was blitzing, he knew that his tight end would have a huge leverage advantage on his out route. Mayfield's intended target, Austin Hooper, got tackled post-snap, which drew a holding penalty, but he still hit Odell Beckham for an 18-yard gain while improvising. The information that Mayfield gained from his pre-snap hard count allowed him to have a post-snap plan, which is so important against the Blitz. And at this point, these stat comparisons are getting repetitive, but plays like these are why Mayfield's performance against the Blitz improved so much from 2019 to 2020. His completion percentage increased by 10%, his average yards per attempt went up by 2 yards, his touchdown percentage increased by 3%, and his pass rating jumped by over 25. I could go on and on about how much Kevin Stefanski's adjustments benefited his quarterback, but Stefanski's influence goes far beyond Baker Mayfield, and in a way, his role in creating one of the best rushing offenses in the league is more impressive than anything else on the long list of great things that he did to improve this offense in his first year as the head coach. Like I said earlier, Stefanski comes from the Shanahan slash Kubiak coaching tree, which emphasizes the use of wide zone, a zone scheme run play where each offensive lineman takes a play side step while the running back reads the defensive lineman and makes one cut based on the leverage of those linemen. Here's an example. Up front, each defensive lineman is double teamed and whichever lineman is less engaged in that double team will advance to the second level. The running back is reading the leverage of the defensive lineman from outside to inside and will make one of three cuts based on the leverage of those linemen. Those three cuts are called bounce, bang, and bend. So ideally, Nick Chubb would take his bounce read to the outside of his left tackle, but because the right side edge defender is leveraged outside, he continues to move across the defensive line from outside to inside. 
Because the nose tackle is also leveraged outside, Chubb takes his bang read through the backside A-gap for a 21-yard gain. In 2019, when Stefanski was the offensive coordinator in Minnesota, just under 70% of the team's carries were zone scheme run plays, and the Vikings had, and still have, one of the best rushing offenses in the league under that zone-heavy approach. The Browns' offensive line, however, would occasionally struggle with those same zone scheme designs. Time and time again last season, while running wide zone, a lineman would struggle to seal his assignment while moving laterally, or miss on a cut block, allowing their assignment to get into the backfield. Stefanski originally installed a zone-heavy run game in Cleveland, but with the help of legendary offensive line coach Bill Callahan, he realized that the zone-heavy approach was limiting the potential of his rushing attack. In weeks 1-4 to of the 2020 season, zone scheme run plays made up over 50% of Cleveland's carries, but by the end of the season, Cleveland's run game was extremely diverse, including more gap scheme designs such as power, duo, and counter. Considering the high rate of zone scheme usage in Minnesota and the success that run game brought to the Vikings offense, Stefanski's ability to adjust his own philosophy to get the best out of his players makes his 2020 season even more impressive. I was high on the Browns going into last season, and those of you who watched my video on the same topic from May of 2020 would know, but I did not expect such a quick turnaround. Cleveland's offense is a downright powerhouse, Stefanski is coming off one of the greatest rookie coaching debuts in league history, and the defense is unproven, but roster-wise, they're stacked. I'm not a Browns fan, but those of you who are have a lot to be excited about moving forward. You've got a very young, very talented team to watch for the foreseeable future, so be patient, but enjoy it. And remember that this is just the beginning. Before I go, I have to give you guys a huge thank you for 10,000 subscribers. I appreciate each and every one of you who takes the time out of your day to listen to me talk about football, and I love interacting with you guys, so drop a comment about the Browns, or fantasy football, or anything really, and I'll reply to as many as I can. I'm also undecided on my next video topic, so if you have any ideas, let me know. But I think that's it, so again, thanks so much for 10k, and I hope to see you in the next one. Later.